Welcome to today's discussion. My name is Glenn Deason. With me is uh, Alexander Mercuris from the Duran and John Mersheimer, the great IR scholar of our time. Uh, welcome to the both of you. Um, so I, I thought we could start off by discussing an article uh, written by yeah, Professor Mersheimer, uh, recently called uh, Death and Destruction in Gaza, uh, referring then to Israel's actions in Gaza with the support of the US, uh, you know, being a crime against humanity that uh, seemingly has no military purpose. And uh, well, when I first read the article, I, my first thought was it didn't seem like a usual Mersheimer article because uh, as, you know, a political realist, uh, you often tend to analyze, you know, cold, cold hard national interests to assess uh, how to explain the actions of states. But in this article, you you know, begin by writing that uh, some of the purpose was you know, put on historical record now that not all Americans were supporting these uh, crimes being committed. And also in your conclusion, you suggest, you know, ask if there's no decency left. So I, I agree with the sentiment completely. I just uh, made that observation that it's uh, it stands maybe a bit out from your usual writing. Uh, but taking me to this point, though, what would be the cold, hard national interest really in Gaza? Because... Uh, from for the Israelis, uh, like why why this indiscriminate killing, the massacre of civilians, destruction of hospitals and civilian infrastructure, deliberately starving the population? Again, what you're describing is, uh, uh, of course, we can even if we ignore the issue of morality and decency, this action seems to be alienating Israel's allies and uniting its adversaries, which could be even suicidal for Israel in the long run. So. Well, first, from Israel's perspective, how, how does this serve Israeli interest? And secondary, how does it serve U.S. or even European interest? Because uh, I would say both, just both the U.S. and the EU continue largely to express unconditional support, making themselves complicit in this crime to a large extent. So uh, again, I don't see how this can be defined by our national interest, either Americans or the Europeans. Uh, so the collapse of our moral standing, you know, surely impacts our system position in the international system. So, uh, yeah, it was just interesting, actually, yeah, both your perspective, but yeah, perhaps go with John first. Well, you raised a lot of different issues, but let me start by just talking about what I think the Israelis are up to uh, in, in Gaza. I think their main goal is to ethically cleanse Gaza, uh, to force the Palestinians who live in Gaza to go to Egypt and to go to Jordan so that uh, Gaza is empty of Palestinians. I think that's the principal goal. And what they're doing is they are murdering huge numbers of Palestinians. Uh, uh, they've murdered about 70,000, excuse me, about 20,000, 70% of whom are, are women and children. Uh, they're also going to great lengths to starve the population. Uh, they're destroying the infrastructure. They're making the place basically unlivable. Uh, they're humiliating the Palestinians, uh, destroying hospitals. And uh, again, all of this, I believe, is uh, for the purpose of driving the Palestinians out. Uh, however, they may not be able to do that. Uh, and therefore, what they're doing is they're punishing the Palestinians and basically sending them a clear message that if they're not driven out, they should understand that if they ever rise up again and rebel, they will pay a god-awful price once again. Uh, the Israelis have long believed in the Iron Wall, and the Iron Wall, which is a term that was invented by Zev Yabotinsky, who was a Zionist on the right uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, believed, the Iron Wall believes, or it's predicated on the assumption <clears throat> that you can beat the Palestinians into submission. So I think absent a uh, successful ethnic cleansing campaign, uh, what this is, is a massive punishment campaign to get the uh, Palestinians to submit to Israeli domination. At the same time, it's very important to understand that the Israelis are interested in going after Hamas and destroying Hamas. And going after Hamas and destroying Hamas is different than the punishment campaign directed against the civilian population. 
which I just described. And one of the really big questions that's on the table these days is whether or not they can destroy Hamas. Uh, but their goal is to destroy Hamas. Now, if they drive all the Palestinians out of Gaza, uh, Gaza is emptied of Palestinians, then they solve the Hamas problem. But if they don't drive the Palestinians out, and so far it looks like they're not going to be able to do that, then the question is, can they defeat Hamas? My argument would be, just to give you a quick assessment of this, uh, is that the Israelis are doing an excellent job of murdering huge numbers of civilians and destroying Gaza. But they're not doing a very good job of getting Hamas. Uh, if you follow this closely, there's very little evidence that the Israelis have killed or captured large numbers of Hamas fighters. Uh, they're not parading or showing pictures of Hamas fighters that they've captured. Uh, and at the same time, you know, if you follow what's going on uh, in telegram channels, it's quite clear that the Palestinians, here we're talking about Hamas, are inflicting significant casualties uh, and doing uh, significant damage to Israeli military equipment. So the Israelis are in quite a fight uh, inside of Gaza, and it's not at all clear uh, that they're going to defeat Hamas. Uh, so that, I think, is basically where we stand today uh, with regard to the campaign, the Israeli campaign uh, in Gaza. Yeah, I mean, can, can I say this is fully consistent with my own views? Uh, I, I, I get to speak a little bit now as a Greek, because obviously I, I was educated and brought up within a Greek tradition of statecraft. And I think it is fair to say that in amongst with, in Greeks, going all the way back to antiquity, the fact that there is conflict between states and the fact that there is violence between states is something that is taken as absolutely red. It's we, we are not, you know, deluded about this. But it's always been understood that, that when you do resort to violence, you must do so for a realizable and achievable objective and that you must know what you're doing. If not, unconstrained violence is not only immoral, if you like, it is also counterproductive. It works against you in the end. If you cannot destroy Hamas and you cannot displace the entire population of Gaza. And if, in fact, trying to pursue those two objectives at one and the same time actually means that you can't properly execute on either one of them, then what you are doing is a profound mistake, at which point it is no longer realistic or rational. It becomes dangerous and in irrational and profoundly misconceived. So I think that is, you know, that is a, that's the tradition, if you like, that I was brought up with. And it is, I think, what we're seeing in Gaza being played out now is exactly an expression of that extraordinary violence to no rational, at least what I would call rational, achievable end. And of course, that is morally wrong. And of course, when you're doing something that is of that nature and you persist in doing it, then of course, questions of morality become even more uh, pronounced. You see children be killed, you see women be killed in that kind of fashion. And that becomes not just wrong, morally speaking, it becomes abhorrent as well. And I think if we're looking at the general situation in the Middle East, in the, not just the Middle East, but in the world, 
in Europe as well, by the way, I suspect to some extent also in the United States, we can also see that this policy that Israel is conducting is losing Israel friends, it is losing Israel international support after a period of time when Israel has been relatively very successful for the last 20, 30 years in gaining international acceptance. It is now forfeiting some of that and it is turning more and more people to become increasingly critical of it. And to the extent that the US government has associated itself with these policies, what Israel is doing is pulling the United States down as well. So I, I'm sorry if I've you know brought into this something of my own tradition, but you know, just to say, my my aunt was a political leader in Greece, my father was a diplomat. I've known many people within you know diplomatic academies. I speak to people in our part of the world in Greece. So, you know, it is what I was brought up with, uh, brought up to. I think what you're saying, Alexander, is that basically what the Israelis are doing doesn't make sense. It's wrongheaded from both a moral and a strategic point of view. Precisely. Exactly so. And because, and a Greek would say, because it, it doesn't make any kind of strategic sense and involves unconstrained violence, that makes it ultimately not just more, not just, you, you know, doesn't make it, doesn't make sense from a moral point of view. It makes it abhorrent. It's, it is, it, it, it becomes, it becomes literally senseless. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to uh, allude to before, because uh, if mm. all, killing all of these civilians in Gaza would have elevated Israel's security and brought about a political settlement, forced through a political settlement, you know, one could, uh, uh, of course, yes, still morally very problematic, but one could have justified it in terms of national interest. But uh, uh, but it seems uh, everyone's national interest will be much worse uh, as a result of this. And uh, but uh, yeah, I, I do want to extend on that because you mentioned I think the objective is ethnic cleansing. But mm. if you have this huge Palestinian population in what the Israelis want to be Greater Israel, uh, you know you you can either ethnically cleanse the population or you can put them mm. under your administration under apartheid. Uh, is there a third option? Is there any other possibility? Because after this, it doesn't really seem like the Palestinians would accept. Uh, <laughs> Uh, living under uh, apartheid system, as you know, Netanyahu suggested that they might seize uh, control over Gaza and uh, and administer it a bit like uh, West Bank, I guess. But uh, is there a third option? And uh, again, if apartheid doesn't work, what else are you left with? I, I think there are four options here, Glenn. That's not to say that they're all viable. Let's just say theoretically or analytically, there are four options. You have this entity called Greater Israel, and you have roughly an equal number of Palestinians and Israeli Jews living in Greater Israel. You can, <coughs> excuse me, do one of four things. One, you could turn it into a true democracy, where in effect everybody gets one vote. The Israeli Jews will not go down that road because you will end up with a Palestinian state, not a Jewish state. So true democracy or real democracy is off the table. The second solution, which the United States has pushed uh, for years, is a two-state solution. And as you know, lots of people are now saying once the shooting stops, we have to move to a two-state solution. But the fact is, the Israelis who are in control have zero interest in a two-state solution. That's not going to happen, in large part because the United States and Israel are joined at the hip. And if Israel doesn't want a two-state solution, they can rely on the United States to make sure it doesn't happen. That leaves two other alternatives, which were the ones that you, Glenn, just laid out. One is apartheid, which is what you have now, or two is ethnic cleansing. And there's no question that the Israelis understand that apartheid is probably not a viable political order over the long term. And this present conflict has put the Palestinian issue on the front burner. And it shows 
there's no evidence that it's going to go away. So the fact that Israel is an apartheid state and that the Israelis treat the Palestinians with great cruelty is obvious to huge numbers of people in the world. So apartheid over the long term does not look like a sustainable political order. That's why the Israelis are so interested in ethnic cleansing. They would like to do in 2023 or 2024 what they did in 1948 when they cleansed large parts of Palestine or what they did in 1967 in the West Bank after they captured the West Bank in the Six Day War. They'd like to ethnically cleanse. And the problem that they face is that it's very difficult to ethnically cleanse. The United States, to its credit, and the United States has not done much to its credit in this conflict, but one thing it has done is said that the Israelis cannot cleanse Gaza, uh, or the West Bank for that matter, because you want to understand the Israelis are not only interested in cleansing Gaza, they would like to cleanse the West Bank as well. And we have told them they can't do that. So it looks at the moment like they can't do that. And the end result is you're going to have an apartheid state for as far as the eye can see. And as Alexander was saying, and I know you agree, Glenn, this is disastrous for the Israelis. And it's disastrous for the United States because we're joined at the hip with the Israelis. Indeed. Can I just say, it, coming back to your very first points, John, um, if you actually look at if you read the statements that some Israeli officials have made, I mean, they clearly point towards an ethnic cleansing intention. I mean, it, it, it is, I find it impossible to construe them in any other way. I, I, I don't think this is, a, I don't think this is an option that Israel has. I think it's an appalling option, uh, um, um, a, a terrible option for Israel to execute. But I don't think it is one which is achievable. And I think the one thing that this crisis in Gaza has perhaps done is that it has brought us to that point where we have reached an impasse. Israel has found, it finds itself now in an impasse where it, it, it has to look at its various options. I mean, that makes it sound a more rational process than it can possibly be. But where where Israel is looking at, you know, possible ways forward. And the one that it desires, which at least what some of its officials desire, which is ethnic cleansing, is blocked. And all the other options look bad also. And I think maybe just possibly over time, if that fact is internalized, then who knows, maybe there might be some rethinking taking place within Israel itself. But that's a long time in the future. But just to switch gears for a second here and move away from the ethnic cleansing mm. and the punishment campaign against the mm. civilian population and focus instead on the campaign against Hamas. If I'm right that they are not being very successful, they're not achieving much success in eliminating Hamas. What are the consequences for Israel if Hamas lives to fight another day? Uh, I mean, the Israeli leaders have promised that they would decisively defeat Hamas. Hamas was going to be eliminated, period, end of the story. It doesn't look like they're succeeding on that front. And we can tell all sorts of stories why they're not likely to succeed. Uh, where does that leave Israel when this conflict is over? Uh, I, I, th I, I think defeated is the answer. I, I mean, I think it would be very, very difficult if you have a situation where there is a Hamas still in Gaza and it has not been destroyed and the conflict has ended. I think it would be very difficult to avoid, including within Israel itself, seeing this as anything other than a defeat. In fact, it, 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 I, I, I seem to remember... Kissinger made, the late Dr. Kissinger made this very point about insurgencies. I think he was talking about Vietnam, actually, in the mid-60s, that what the insurgent has to do in order to win is survive. That's right. And, and that, is, that is what Hamas is doing. 
Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Uh, and also, I would note for Benjamin Netanyahu's political future, it's essential that Hamas be defeated. But if it's impossible to defeat Hamas decisively, that will have negative consequences for his political future. It also appears this would have a wider uh, implications for uh, Israel's security, though, because uh, it seems uh, Israel's security largely relies on deterrence. Uh, you know, surrounded by increasingly powerful neighbors, the, the image that it's all powerful and can destroy anyone. You know, if these uh, you know Hamas fighters disappearing into their you know little holes or their tunnels, uh, if they can't even be defeated, this uh, a lot of the image and uh, the ability to deter would surely diminish or am I putting too much <laughs> focus or effort uh, on the deterrence there? Well, I, I think you're right, but let me just come at it from a slightly different angle. The Israelis have always accepted the fact that they could not completely eliminate Palestinian resistance. And what they talked about doing was managing the problem. So you want to understand that Hamas was alive and well in Gaza well before October 7. And indeed, the Netanyahu government worked with Hamas to get Hamas to help the Israelis undermine the two-state process, right? So the Israelis were managing Gaza quite well up until October 7th. Uh, and it looked like, even though Hamas was there as a threat, it was not that serious a threat. What happens on October 7th is you have this horrendous attack, and the Israelis are caught with their pants down, and they suffer a humiliating defeat. It's a tactical defeat. It's not a strategic defeat by any means. But they suffer this humiliating defeat. And the question then is, how do you respond if you're the Israelis? And the Israelis decide that what they're going to do is eliminate Hamas, right? We're going to get rid of it. The reason they never tried to get rid of Hamas beforehand was not simply because it was useful for uh, avoiding a two-state solution. They didn't get rid of Hamas because it was almost impossible to get rid of Hamas. And they knew that if they got rid of Hamas, that uh, another group would spring up in its place, okay? So... They manage the problem. That management process failed on October 7th. So the question is, what do you do then if you're playing their hand? If I were playing their hand, I would have just said, look, this was a terrible, terribly unfortunate incident on October 7th. But we can't defeat Hamas militarily. It makes no sense to invade Gaza. We'll just be jumping into quicksand. And instead, what we ought to do is think about how to do the management process more smartly moving forward. That's what they should have done, because you can't eliminate Hamas. But they didn't do that. They were enraged, and they decided that they would invade uh, Gaza and pursue a punishment campaign against the civilian population to maybe ethnically cleanse uh, Gaza and also go after Hamas. But as we have been saying here, the likelihood of success is incredibly small. And the end result, uh, I think Alexander is right, is that the uh, Israelis will ultimately suffer a defeat. <laughs> The, the thing, the, the great problem, and it actually goes back to um, some of the things we were discussing before, is that it's, I, I, I remember, I think all of us at various points said, right at the start of this, that it would be a mistake for Israel to march into Gaza, that if they went into Gaza, they would be going into a trap. I, I was in a discussion program with an American military officer or, or retired American military officer Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. He said exactly that. He made exactly the point that you've been making, John. Uh, defeating, destroying Hamas in Gaza is so difficult and could only be achieved at such cost that it is simply not something 
realistically that you should consider you should try to do. So it's all very well. We, we could all see that. But was it ever really likely that Israel would act in any way different from the one it has? We've just did recently a programme with a former British diplomat, Alistair Crook, who knows this region well. He knows people in Hamas. He knows people on the Israeli side. He got quite close at one time to Ariel Sharon. And his view is that there is going to be a war, that we're now in a situation where a war is inevitable, and that the only thing that has, what has to happen is for the process to play itself out. And only then, when the war is over, and one side or the other has lost, is it going to be possible for diplomats, like he used to be, to come in and start picking up the pieces. That there was never any realistic possibility that Israel, with the kind of state it's become, the kind of politics it's had, would have acted of its own accord in any different way. One other dimension to this that's worth mentioning is that if you run an apartheid state like the Israelis do, what you invariably end up doing is uh, dehumanizing uh, the victims. And here we're talking about the Palestinians. They become subhuman. They become untermenschen. You speak about them in terms of being animals or human animals and so forth and so on. And if you think of your adversary in those terms, and the Palestinians are the Israelis' adversary, if you think about your adversary in those terms and your adversary attacks you the way uh, events developed on October 7th, uh, your basic instinct right from the get-go is, to to is going to be uh, one that calls for going in and killing all of those animals, uh, destroying those subhumans. And if you look at the rhetoric of Israeli leaders about the Palestinians and about what they would like to do in Gaza, I think it's horrifying. It's just hard to believe uh, that the Israelis uh, are talking this way. And by the way, it's quite amazing that here in the United States, hardly anyone has castigated them, criticized them for talking that way. Uh, you know, in liberal America, this is supposed to be verboten. You're, you're not supposed to talk about your adversary in those terms. I mean, as much as there is acute Russophobia in the United States, and there is incredible Russophobia in the United States, and the West more generally, as both of you know, we don't talk about the Russians uh, as human animals or untermenschen. Uh, it is a case of good versus evil. They're the bad guys, we're the good guys. But beyond that, we don't talk about Russians as subhumans. Certainly the elites don't talk that way. But if you listen to the Israeli elites talking, it's shocking uh, the extent to which they characterize the Palestinians in the most horrific terms. I guess this is yeah where the red flags of uh, genocide would come up because this is always what you uh, we would expect before a genocide would be either top down where the elites are encouraging uh, yeah view, viewing the adversary as being uh, subhuman or cockroach you know usually using this uh, animalistic terms or or sometimes you see it all, also coming uh, coming uh, organically from a from below when you know soldiers are sent out to massacre a lot of people they have a often impulse or instinct to uh, deprive them of humanity as they're going to kill them but either way the rhetoric is quite consistent if you look at the history of genocide so all of this should really put up some red flags and being discussed because it's uh, you hear these discussions you know they they're all yeah animals they we should they're all terrorists we should just to eliminate all of Gaza, you know, where half the population are children or minors. This is, uh, uh, it, it doesn't get much discussion. Uh, but um, but I, I, I did want to shift a, a little bit. Uh, 
because you know obviously as alexander pointed out this uh, you, you can't really stop this war anymore it's pierced but but it also appears to be spreading because the last time we all met and discussed we were asking oh how, how could this conflict possibly uh, spread or develop into a regional war and you know we already now seem to have some indications because uh, the Israelis and the Americans are now suggesting that uh, they need a military campaign against the Hezbollah in Lebanon as they want to buffer zone pushing Hezbollah further up north, something they're not going to do voluntarily, I assume. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, the United States, as well as its partners, uh, might attack Yemen as well. Uh, Houthi controlled Yemen to demonstrate its solidarity with Palestine and, you know, protecting the ships in the Red Sea. Uh, but again, there doesn't seem to be any interest in dealing with the problem what the Lebanese and the uh, when Yemen are responding to. Instead, uh, it seems quite determined to go for escalation. And you know, even if they go after Yemen, what's next? Will Iran get pulled in? You know, will the Chinese, will the Russians allow Iran to fail? This this could be a catastrophe. Uh, how wh where where are we going with this? If you would look in your crystal ball or <laughs> as uh, Alexander, you want to jump in on yeah. this one? I'll yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is, we go, get, we go back exactly to the point that John was making. When you are up against, when you hit, um, you know, a, a wall, when you are no longer able to do what you want to do and you're facing defeat and you have got yourself into the mindset that the Israeli leaders have, and John is absolutely right, the language from Israel has been terrible and I have never done international war crimes law. I've never practiced it. I've known people who do. And I can say that some of this rhetoric could certainly conceivably be used if we ever were to get into war crimes trials and that kind of thing, which it must also be said is so unlikely, unfortunately, perhaps, as to be almost inconceivable. But when you have that kind of mindset, and you're up against this kind of situation, then it's not surprising <laughs> that they're looking for other things that they can do to compensate for their failure in Gaza, because that's what it looks to me. So you talk about Hezbollah, you have, so you, you demand withdrawals from by Hezbollah from the north, because you're not achieving what you want in Gaza. That will, of course, compound your problems even more but that, I think, is what people do. I mean, I, I've seen it happen in legal terms. Uh, you know, when I was doing litigation work with people, when they find themselves losing, they start actually making more mistakes and becoming more reckless. And I think this is what we're seeing. And, of course, we also have this problem now in the Red Sea, and that is a very strange and complex problem as well. And, again, the only solution seems to be to deploy more and more warships there and to try this talk now of missile strikes apparently on the Houthis in Yemen. In other words, war against the Houthis, a decade of war against the Houthis, but the Saudis didn't achieve very much. But apparently we're going to go down that same route. But it seems to me that it is ultimately Gaza, the situation that is there, which is the core. If Israel had been able to go into Gaza and achieve its objectives, say destroying Hamas in the first few weeks, then we would not be talking in the way that we are now about Hezbollah and about Yemen, or so it seems to me. Yeah, I, I think there's no question that uh, given what's going on in Gaza, uh, the uh, forces uh, in southern Lebanon, here we're talking about Hezbollah, have upped the ante against the Israelis. So you have real trouble on Israel's northern border with Hezbollah. And the Houthis in uh, Yemen have made it clear that the reason that they're attacking shipping in the Red Sea is what is going on in Gaza. They're doing this in support of the Palestinians. So you have these two potential arenas for escalation. One, Hezbollah versus Israel, and two, the Houthis versus the West. 
because the Houthis are making it almost impossible to send shipping through the Red Sea. And that matters greatly because the Red Sea runs into the Suez Canal, and it's in effect the Red Sea and the Suez Canal that connect uh, shipping traffic coming out of Asia with uh, the Mediterranean, which means Europe. So, <coughs> excuse me. So <laughs> even if you think about the Persian Gulf, a lot of the oil that comes out of the Persian Gulf comes out of the Persian Gulf and then goes through the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal into Europe. So cutting off the Red Sea is a huge problem for the West. And that's why the West, and here we're talking mainly about the United States, is assembling a naval task force in the region and talking about attacking the Houthis and eliminating that threat to shipping in the Red Sea. Well, what happens if we do attack the Houthis, who, by the way, are heavily supported by the Iranians? The Iranians may come in, and the Iranians are on one side of the Persian Gulf. Yemen is on one side of the Red Sea. So you see the potential for escalation in this terribly important area for economic intercourse is really great. And then, of course, go back to Hezbollah. Hezbollah has about 150,000 rockets and missiles aimed at Israel. If that one began to escalate in a serious way, who knows where it would end up? The Israelis have promised that they would destroy Beirut, that they would do to Lebanon what they're doing in Gaza. Would you put that beyond the Israelis? No, I think there's a good chance that if a war starts between Hezbollah and Israel, the damage to Lebanon will be enormous. And by the way, the damage to Israel will be enormous from those 150,000 rockets and missiles. So this one can spin out of control in all sorts of ways. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it can happen. And this is why the United States is actually working overtime to prevent that from happening. This is not in our interest. Uh, but again, uh, how much control we have uh, remains to be seen. I feel the. Sure. Yeah, oh, no, was, I just feel the, the what the coalition of the willing, if you will, which has been built up in uh, the Red Sea by the United States. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering if there's a switch and bait going on here, because uh, you know at the moment they're building up this coalition to protect the ships going through. Uh, so Britain, Norway, um, a bunch of other other countries, Netherlands have all signed up for this. Uh, however, uh, at the moment we see you know the Yemen uh, sending a drone, a two thousand dollar drone, and the Americans have to intercept it with a two million dollar missile. Obviously, this isn't gonna. In the, in the long run, this isn't going to work. So it, it it appears that the decision has been made to strike Yemen if uh, if if this doesn't stop, because this is certainly doesn't seem to be sustainable. In which that whole coalition would not merely protect ships anymore, but then uh, join in on the attack against. Uh, well, to be honest, a people which has been ravaged since uh, 2015 at last. So this is. Uh, uh, I don't know. Do, do you think the coalition would hold if this trans transfer or translates uh, from a uh, you know uh, protecting ships to going on a, on an attack against the Yemen? I personally don't know. Uh, I mean, I think the United States would be in a good position to coerce its allies into coming along with the Americans. Uh, how much of the actual fighting uh, America's allies would do is open to question. But I, I think those allies would basically do uh, enough to make it look like the coalition was holding. I mean, the real problem here, Glenn, is that all sorts of shipping companies just are refusing uh, to send ships through the Red Sea. Uh, I mean, the Houthis don't even have to strike and hit. A, uh, uh, a ship uh, to send a message uh, to uh, these shipping companies that they shouldn't send ships through the Red Sea. The mere presence of a threat that those ships will be sunk is pretty much enough to keep those shipping companies from sending ships through the Red Sea. Very much like the Black Sea, uh, Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what, uh, first of all, I should say that there are already British warships in the region, and I believe there's 
They're, they're there from other Western states, and I'm sure we'll be there. Uh, whatever the Americans uh, uh, have to do, I'm sure we will support them. But what I wanted to ask, and it, let's go back to John, because it's a point I know that you've made in the past, which is that this unequivocal support for Israel, this sense of you know the United States and Israel being joined at the hip, can produce outcomes which are not at all in the interests of the United States. And we've just talked about the fact, you've just talked about the fact that the United States does not want to see uh, um, an expanded war in the Middle East. It does not want to see the Red Sea closed. It does not want to see the Persian Gulf closed. It wants oil to move and it wants peaceful conditions, or at least stable conditions. Let's not talk about peaceful conditions. Stable conditions in the Middle East. And yet, the region why the situation in the Middle East now is becoming so unstable, the reason why there are these problems in the Red Sea and in the Persian Gulf potentially, is because there is this conflict in Gaza and there are problems on Israel's northern border. Surely the logical thing to do, if you were the United States, is to tell the Israelis to stop. <laughs> Say to them, look, we understand that you have this major problem uh, with Hamas. We understand that it might be a defeat for you. But it would be fundamentally contrary to our interests and to most of the world's to see a regional war in the Middle East and the interruption of oil supplies. Now, am I getting this wrong? <laughs> and if I'm not, if there is some American interest in expanding the war, which I can't see, well, I can understand that. But if I'm getting it right, why is this never talked about in that way in the United States? And why is the United States um, unable itself to sort out its own problems and explain these things so clearly and straightforwardly to the Israelis? This is a difficult question, perhaps, but nonetheless, I mean, am I not making a point here? No, look, there is no question that Israel is not a strategic asset to the United States. And indeed, if you look at what's going on uh, in the Middle East today, it's clear that Israel is a strategic liability for the United States. I would emphasize that since the administration of Jimmy Carter, Every United States president has worked hard to get Israel to accept a two-state solution because American presidents and the American foreign policy establishment in general has long understood that if you're going to put an end to the Israel-Palestine problem, you're going to get real stability surrounding Israel. You had to have a two-state solution. But we have been unable to get a two-state solution. Instead, we've ended up with an apartheid Israel. And the end result of that is the mess that you see today. This tells you that Israel is a strategic liability. Now, some people say we support Israel unconditionally, not for strategic reasons, but for moral reasons. Well, if you look at what's going on in Gaza today, it is impossible to make the argument that we should support Israel for moral reasons. In fact, we shouldn't support Israel if you're going to, you know, bring in the moral dimension. But what is what this all says is that there is no strategic case for supporting Israel unconditionally, and there is no moral case for supporting Israel unconditionally. Therefore, why do we support Israel the way we do? Why are we joined at the hip with Israel? Why do we have this relationship which is unparalleled in modern history? And the answer is the Israel lobby. And the fact is in the United States, we have this Israel lobby, we have an Israel lobby that is a remarkably powerful interest group that works over time to make sure that the United States supports Israel unconditionally. And anyone who comes along and criticizes Israel 
uh, or criticizes the lobby or criticizes the relationship between the United States and Israel, uh, points out that it doesn't make strategic or moral sense, uh, is going to be attacked. And uh, there is a good chance that that person's career will be ended. And the end result of all this is hardly anybody is willing to stand up and say the emperor has no clothes. Uh, you just don't have any real discussion uh, in the United States. And I would argue you no longer have such a discussion in Britain uh, or in Europe more generally on whether it makes sense to support Israel unconditionally. Uh, and again, it's because of the lobby. I mean, look at what happened to Jeremy Corbyn in <laughs> I don't believe for one second that Jeremy Corbyn was an anti-Semite, but the uh, the British version of the Israel lobby went after him, hammer and tongue, and did a successful job of portraying him as an anti-Semite and making the argument that Labour, the Labour Party, had been infected with anti-Semitism. And I believe the lobby's great concern was that Jeremy Corbyn was critical of Israel, that labor was critical of Israel. And if labor came to power and Corbyn was the prime minister, uh, he would go after Israel uh, on human rights grounds. And the best way to avoid that is to go after Corbyn and make sure he doesn't become prime minister, which is exactly what happened. Uh, so you have this situation where Israel gets unconditional support from the United States, and increasingly so from Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a situation like the one that we have today. Now, my final point on this is that I believe, and Steve Walton and I argued this when we wrote our article and then book on the Israel lobby, that this unconditional support is not only bad for the United States, it's bad for Israel as mm -hmm. well. In other words, the lobby's efforts to get the United States to never criticize Israel and support it no matter what it did has allowed Israel to turn itself into an apartheid state. And it has allowed Israel to avoid adopting a two-state solution. If we had, we meaning the United States, had been able to put enormous pressure on Israel and get it to accept the two-state solution, I believe we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. The Israelis would not be in the mess they're in today. But that was impossible to do, and here we are. What you're describing uh, now, well, what you're describing now is uh, the U.S. almost as an irrational actor now, because you know, from the realist perspective, a rational actor should, you know, respond to the. Uh, uh, systematic pressures from the well, from the, uh, according to the, in, the logic of the international balance of power, in order to maximize its security. But what you're suggesting is the, you know, the decision maker being influenced by the lobby isn't actually, you know, acting the way it, it would have in order to elevate the security. And I'm just thinking this. It seems to be a uh, maybe a common trend because, of course, you have a very powerful Israeli lobby, but uh, I also feel the the rhetoric itself is uh, is. Um, limiting the ability of states to act according to their own national interests as for example uh, we see the same with the you know U ukraine or well first with israel if you criticize israel uh, as you mentioned you you end up well like corbyn perhaps you're an anti-semite and you can't wash that off uh, your reputation afterwards but we saw the same in ukraine as well because we at least me and alexander we often discuss that why why why? Why do we keep sending all these men to die? There's no way you can win this war. But, but again, we we had the same rhetoric around this that uh, you know if you call for diplomacy negotiations, then you know you're treasonous. You you're in a Russian propagandist. You know if you're pro-Ukrainian means you know you, you you suppress the opposition in Ukraine and you send all their men and now women to the front to die. And this was the only acceptable pro-Ukrainian position. So. Uh, is, is this what's preventing states from acting in their national interests? Because I, I think this is a commonality in both with Israel and Ukraine. That I don't see how this is benefiting us or uh, our well, less client states, but uh, let's call them our partners, if you will. Well, I, I just want to be very clear here that I agree with you completely that our policy, America's policy towards Israel is inconsistent with realist logic. As you know, I'm sort of 
uh, a well-known realist. And I believe the world, by and large, works according to realist principles. My argument is that states usually act in their national interest. The Israel case, the Israel lobby story, contradicts my basic theory of international politics. That's effectively what you're saying. And I want to be clear that that's true. And by the way, my co-author, Steve Walt, who teaches at Harvard, he's also a realist. He has a different realist theory than I do, but he's a realist. And our article and our book contradicts his theory as well as my theory. Well, it doesn't have to contradict because if you have the international distribution of power, it's not, uh, realism is not a foreign policy theory. So you're just saying this is the incentives to maximize security, but it doesn't mean that foreign policy will reflect this. So for example, in neoclassical realism, you would have the decision maker as an intervening variable, which could be you know, influenced by rational issues, such as you know, lobbies or uh, the fear of being called an anti-Semite or you know, this. But anyway, that maybe too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm tempted to say I agree with you because that would rescue me. And then I could say <laughs> my theory is correct. Mm. But I actually have a theory that includes a theory of foreign policy, to use your rhetoric. Mm. And what is going on with the lobby does contradict my basic theory. Mm. I'm sad to say, mm. uh, but uh, but it is what it is. I mean, I, I have to agree about Ukraine, though, because, again, it seems to me that what has happened, if we look at the last 30 years of Ukraine, is that those within Ukraine who have always taken maximalist positions in terms of relations with Russia have always been able to win because they've always been confident that behind them is the, is the United States, and by the way, the rest of the West too. So they're all, always able to come to other Ukrainians who have been prepared to say, well, look, it is actually in Ukraine's interests at various times to compromise and to reach solutions. They can always come back and say, well, we don't need to do that because ultimately we're going to win because the Americans and the Europeans will back us. And that has been, I think, a consistent problem. It's always ended this way. It's why, for example, they felt that they can take actions like the one we saw in Maidan in 2014 when a government was overthrown and um, you know, pursue military campaigns, ill-judged military campaigns in eastern Ukraine in the summer of 2014, and why they can ignore the Minsk agreement and do all of these things. Because they say, well, in the end, we can get away with this. We can do this. And because the Americans will support us. So why do we need to compromise why do we need to accept people like President Yanukovych, who does his deals with Russia? Why do we need to grant autonomy to the eastern regions? Why do we need to give people the ability to, you know, have some kind of formal status to Russian? And this has steadily had the effect of making Ukrainian political discussion within Ukraine itself increasingly radicalized and um, voices of, if you like, moderation or compromise, incre increasingly marginal. I think both Glenn and I, who've been following Ukraine one form or another for many years now, we have seen this, how this has actually played out on the ground. I, I do not disagree with you uh, yeah. and uh, at all, but there is a difference between the Israeli case and the Russian case, and that is uh, what is driving the train. In the Israel case, it's this powerful lobby, this powerful interest group inside the United States that really matters. If you talk about the Russian case, what you were just describing, I'm not disagreeing with what you said for sure, but there's no lobby there, right? The, I accept that. Yeah, I bet that. Yeah. So the question is, what's causing this? And I would make the argument that it's, first of all, just acute Russophobia, right? And then second, it was this widespread belief 
that we had triumphed in the Cold War and we were free to move NATO, to move the EU eastward, regardless of what the Russians thought, uh, that we could promote color revolutions regardless of what the Russians thought. There was this sense of omnipotence, this sense that, you know, we were the indispensable nation. We had this huge uh, amount of military power and we could shape the world the way we saw fit. And when you marry that to the Russophobia, right, you get a pattern of behavior that you were just describing, Alexander, that allows the Ukrainians to not negotiate with the Russians and to think they can get away with X, Y, and Z. And of course, in both cases, it's blown up in our face, both in Russia and in Gaza. But you do want to remember that I think in the case of Israel, the American foreign policy elite had the right instincts, which is that you had to get a two-state solution. They just couldn't do it because of Gaza. With regard to Russia and Ukraine, the American foreign policy establishment and the Western foreign policy establishment, certainly to include the British, didn't understand anything uh, uh, in terms of what you know the consequences were going to be uh, of pursuing this policy uh, toward Ukraine. I, I accept that. I, I accept that point completely. Yeah, I think I think the well the wider geostrategic plan. I, I guess you know that 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 would be rational to some extent because if you if you're the United States in the '90s, you want to create a world based on uh, one center of power hegemony, then of course this expanding NATO is how you create collective hegemony in the pan-European space and. As you know, Brzezinski and others always point out, Ukraine is a key piece because once you have Ukraine part of the collective West, then Russia is completely expelled from Europe, and you know this would be the logic. So I, I can accept, you know, I, I see the, the the rationality behind this. If you want to have a security system based on hegemony, uh, that being said, uh, there there seems to be the implementation of this. There seems to be some irrationality because on one hand. You know the, the 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 impulse to do this is always because you know the Russians are you know can be all powerful and evil. On the other hand, we're always saying, oh no, they're also very backwards, and you know they 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 will fold immediately. They they can't you know stand up to us, which which you just alluded to. So this uh, assumption of uh, or even hubris, uh, you know, it 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 also would diminish some rationality because I uh, it. It just seems uh, a lot of the foreign policy makers, the the ones publishing in you know foreign affairs, uh, the, all the articles seem almost like wishful thinking, you know, hoping uh, that something, you know, the natural order order will restore itself, that the Russians will fall, and you know the West will uh, you know <laughs> seize the battlefield, if you will. It's a bit, it's amazing uh, what's going on in the West these days. I think everybody recognizes that the balance of power has shifted significantly toward the Russians. The Russians are on the march. And if you think about what the war is going to look like over the next year, it looks like the Ukrainians might not even be able to hang on and continue fighting. The Russians could knock them out completely. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but the Russians are on the march and all of the key indicators of future military success favor the Russians. So what is the West doing? It's filled with articles. The Western press is filled with articles talking about different ways that we can rescue the situation and ultimately achieve victory over the Russians. It's delusional. Mm -hmm. And the ideas that they lay out, Alexander uh, dissects these arguments every day uh, on his show. The arguments that people lay out are just not serious. They more or less assume the Russians are dumkoffs and that they're going to be able to bamboozle the Russians into accepting some scheme for ending the war that will eventually allow Ukraine to win. What are these people thinking? It's just hard to know. Uh, they blew it and they can't really acknowledge that simple fact. Mm. There's been some very, very interesting speak, uh, comments made, both by Putin and Lavrov, by the way, about this over the last 24 hours. And Lavrov's were in some way the more interesting 
because he 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 basically said exactly you know what we've been saying for you know weeks that you know we're not going to agree to just freeze the war and South Korean you know um, solutions because the way the West is talking about this, it's clear that this is simply you know another device to play to buy time. So that they're not going to go they're not going to down go down that road. But I was wondering whether because um, I don't know how closely um, either of you follow the statements that Russian leaders have been making recently. Um, do you sense that there's a now risk that the Russians themselves are starting to become dizzy with success? Because I am starting to think, wonder about this. There's been some very, very extraordinary statements, you know, about, you know, the solution is total victory total surrender by ukraine um that you know we we you, either, either you know ukraine accepts wholesale everything that we demand of them and i've been hearing some extraordinary things about what some people in russia might be demanding of ukraine um either they accept all of that or you know they're they're just going to be absorbed into russia all over again um i, I, I I, I'm seeing whether the Russians themselves aren't becoming a little intoxicated <laughs> with their recent successes and aren't perhaps um, at risk of taking on more in Ukraine than they can actually realistically absorb now. I mean, it has been an independent country for 30 years. It has developed an identity of its own, particularly in the Western regions, but also, I suspect, in central Ukraine, too. And um, the Russians perhaps do need to start being a little bit more realistic also about what they might be able to achieve there. I don't know whether, Glenn, you have any thoughts about this, but John, maybe? Uh, no, I've uh, I've seen uh, some uh some comments from this from the Russians at the UN mission. They they made a statement as well mm -hmm. that they have no more belief in the possibility of a peaceful settlement in terms of the West, you know, putting forward a actual solution uh, which makes uh, Ukraine neutral. Indeed, mm -hmm. whenever we propose freezing the front lines, you know, casually, not in official mm -hmm. agreement, uh, it, it is always in the context that yeah, we'll we'll fight them another time. But this is, of course, does make sense. So. On one hand, yeah, I agree. I think the Russians are now very openly stating that they have no more uh, belief in any political settlement, which means they will only accept full capitulations from the Ukrainians. And I also saw recently now Putin speaking about, uh, uh, you know, the historical lands of Russia and, you know, Odessa being a Russian city and uh, you know, how all these territories were just given in 1922. It was, you know, unjust. You know, perhaps the Poles should take back Lvov. You know, this kind of thing. So I'm, I'm. it seems rhetorically preparing that, uh, I'm not sure if it's a warning shot or if it's just preparing his own population that this might be, you know, we, 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 we're going to take back this land. In other words, everything from Kharkov to Odessa, we, we transferred it to the Ukrainians under a Soviet or under Soviet Union, uh, under their administration. Uh, however, they have not been uh, reasonable caretakers. They have abused this and, uh, you know, uh, oppressed the Russians. So now we'll take it back. This was effectively what I took from his speech. Uh, but uh, no, I, I don't disagree with you. Though. I think one of the things the Russians underestimated was the develop development of a distinctive uh, national uh, Ukrainian identity uh, over the past 30 years, even for the historical Russian regions, uh, which still have a, this is a whole new generation over the past 30 years, which have grown up. And this is why I think, um, uh, I think it was uh, yeah, Solzhenitsyn who, who wrote that, you know, the, the Ukrainians don't understand we're both from the same uh, origin, that we're brothers. And the Russians, he said, don't understand that once you cross the Dnieper, they're completely different from us. So I think this is still something that uh, uh, the Russians might be underestimating. That uh, if they just knock out Zelensky and the, you know, the, the Bandera influencers, uh, that somehow they will just naturally gravitate back to Russia. I don't think. Uh, I think they might be yeah, a bit of wishful thinking. Uh, I'm not sure if what John, if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, let me make. Let me make uh... A couple of points. One is, if you look at 
Putin's famous July 12, 2021 uh, article that he wrote, I actually think it's quite apparent in that piece that he recognizes Ukrainian nationalism. Uh, Putin's own view is we're blood brothers and we're blood sisters. That's Putin's view. But if you look at the piece, he is very clear that there is this powerful force out there called Ukrainian nationalism. And he's actually writing that article in the context of the civil war that's going on in the Donbass. And that's very much about Ukrainian nationalism. So I think Putin is a very smart guy, and ultimately he will understand uh, that there are limits uh, to what the Russians can do in Ukraine because of Ukrainian nationalism, especially the further west you move and the more the land is populated by ethnic Ukrainians. But I uh, uh, want to just sort of raise uh, a, a more general framework for thinking about this issue. And I think, Alexander, that the Russians do sound intoxicated these days. It's what we and I are used to call the victory disease, right? Uh, you begin to think that you have the magic touch and uh, you can go on and on and everything just gets better and better. But uh, the Russians, and here we're talking about Putin, talk about the three objectives that they have, which is denazification, demilitarization, and a neutral Ukraine, a Ukraine that has no security arrangements with the West no NATO uh, membership. Uh, I think to achieve actually all three of those goals, you have to conquer all of Ukraine, mm. right? In other words, if you conquer uh, about 40% of Ukraine, I, I often argue that the Russians are likely to argue, end up with about 43%. Let's assume that they conquer 40% of Ukraine. The other 60% will be a dysfunctional rump state, but that rump state will be run by people that the Russians consider Nazis. It will not be demilitarized because the West will continue to support it, however uh, uh, meekly, but will support it. Uh, and it will have a security relationship with the West. So they will not have achieved their three objectives. I think you have to conquer all of Ukraine to do that. You have to win a decisive victory to achieve those three objectives. Now, is that going to happen? And there, there's sort of two ways of thinking about it. One is that the Ukrainian army just completely collapses. I'm not saying that's likely, but it is a possibility. This is an army that's on the ropes. It is in terrible shape. It could collapse. If it collapses, would the Russians then occupy all of Ukraine? I'm not sure that would be a good thing to do. Then the second question is, if it doesn't collapse, right, the army doesn't collapse, it hangs on, the West continues to support it over time, you don't end up conquering all of Ukraine. And the end result is you don't achieve all three of your objectives. But what you do achieve is that you get back a lot of territory from Ukraine, you make it part of Russia, and you have left over a dysfunctional rub state that is in really no position to join the EU or to join NATO. But I think that's the best the Russians can do. Because I think that conquering all of Ukraine is just asking for really serious trouble. So I'm curious what you think of that, Alexander. Well, Putin, uh, Putin as I said, did give this speech yesterday to the Russian defense ministry. And I'm going to say two things. I haven't read it fully. I haven't yet had time to read it properly. But two things. Firstly, He's very bitter and very angry with the West. And that was something that came across very, very clearly. But I did notice that in terms of what he was saying about Ukraine, he certainly seemed to stop well short 
of some of the things that some of these other Russian officials have been saying. I mean, he did not talk about total victory, total surrender, those kind of things. And my my strong impression was that the major focus for him, the thing that he really will focus on are two things. One, that we will hold on to what is ours, and he defines that as the Russian territories the territories that he thinks were improperly given to Ukraine by the Soviet Union. So he wants to hold on to that, and he wants Ukraine to remain out of NATO. I think that if he gets those two things, he, Putin, will probably still be, will be satisfied. He'll be prepared to walk away. He won't trust the West again. He won't be happy to deal with us in the way that he used to do. He's very self-critical. You can see this. He's very angry with himself, as he puts it, for having been led along the garden path for so long. So he's not going to, whilst he is there, whilst he's still there, we're not going to see any sort of rapprochement between the West and Russia. But in terms of Ukraine itself, I think he's a lot still more level-headed, a lot more level-headed, than some of the other people around him are. That that was my quick takeaway from the speech that he made um, that he made yesterday. Um, I, I, I will probably, if I could just say, I will be discussing it more likely tomorrow than in my program today. I think, um, Glenn, what, Glenn, what are your thoughts on what Alexander said? I mean, and what I said. No, oh, I, I I agree, but I also think there's another option because often it's either. Uh, Either this territory, strategic territory, remains in a Ukraine, which will be very anti-Russian and also courted by the West, or it's annexed by Russia. But of course, the problem for Russia is the further west it goes, the less welcome it will be. Uh, but I'm, I remember this map, which uh, was, Lukashenko was standing in front of, where, he, where Ukraine was split into regions. Now, I'm not sure if uh, there were some uh, goals or objectives of balkanizing or splitting up Ukraine, uh, but, but, uh, but that would possibly be a solution because uh, I think for Ukrainian nationalism in the decades to come will probably remain fiercely anti-Russian. But, you know, it, the problem isn't only to have an anti-Russian Ukraine. The problem is it's too strong. So you can either make a, as you, in your words, you said, make a basket case out of it to make sure that, uh, well, the, the, the economic regions, uh, what makes it strategically valuable, uh, is, well, uh, cease to be part of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, in order to, for Russia not to expose itself or overextend itself, it also has the option of attempting maybe to break up the country a bit uh, because you know the southern regions from Odessa are not necessarily too happy with Lvov. And I think now that the Ukrainians are losing, uh, a lot of the foundations they had for solidarity starts to diminish. I mean, they all seem to turn on each other now. Zelensky, Zelensky. So um, yeah, they, they might choose to walk down 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 that path. Um, I'm not sure if that's something they're even contemplating. But uh, but the, the difference between annexing it from Russia or leaving it in Ukraine will be to push for independence of certain regions and then you know provide them with superior. So, uh, yes, security guarantees or, you know, even some economic benefits uh, that they might, uh, once they've taken the territories, they will, can't accept ending up in NATO's hand at least. But uh, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, this is a similar as in the uh, conflict in the Middle East. I'm not, no one will be able to get everything they want here. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, how do they deal with it? I'm not sure. Glenn, uh, it's quite clear that Putin is talking about Odessa as a Russian city. Alexander has emphasized this on his various shows. Do you think the Russians will attempt to take all of Odessa? And do you think that they will be able to swallow it in the sense that there will be enough pro-Russian sentiment in Odessa that the Russians will not have significant problem absorbing it or annexing it to Russia? I couldn't say enough about the sentiment. I think this war has changed a lot. Uh, I'm also not sure the, the pro-Russian elements. I also uh, got impression from a lot on the Ukrainian Telegram channels that there's a lot of some sympathies for Russia, which you know, you know, don't dare to raise their voices because there will consequences. But I think uh, there's also been a lot of uh, Russia alienated, also a huge part of that population. 
So it, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to say, but uh, I think that Russia would want to cross the Dnieper River and go all the way to Odessa. Uh, furthermore, yeah, it's, it's, it would be the historical legitimacy, given that these were historically Russian lands, but also uh, the, for, for the Black Sea, because the way, you know, if, if NATO is able to link up with uh, Odessa in Ukraine's hand, it will always be a possible uh, you know, dagger pointing at uh, Crimea. So I think they would want to solve this issue. But again, it, it remains to be seen, because I think once the Russians cross the Dnieper River, uh, will attitudes in Europe and America change because uh, then we might get a renewed interest in Ukraine, if you will, because uh, I don't think the NATO countries would like to see the Russians in Odessa either. So, but um, I'm not sure. My I guess is as good as yours, I guess. But if I can ask Alexander a question, just building on what you said, uh, you use the phrase if the Russians cross the Dnieper River, there may be a renewed interest in the West in supporting Ukraine. Alexander, do you think that there would be a renewed interest or just a continued interest? Because as I look at things, there's no evidence that the West is losing its interest in supporting Ukraine. They are having trouble getting this package through the House of Representatives, but it looks like the West is doubling down. Well, in terms of Europe, definitely they are. I mean, certainly in Britain, um, the, the fervor within the political class to support Ukraine remains as strong as ever. And I, I believe the same is true in Germany. I, I don't see any sign of any slackening there. On the contrary, the greater the problems and the more doubts there are about where the Americans might be going, the, the, the more intense emotionally the commitment becomes. Of course, if you talk to people outside the elites, then I suspect most of them have lost interest in this a long time ago, and they probably won't be very interested if it goes to Odessa or not. But they're not the people who will make the decisions. Um, amongst the people who make the decisions, I don't think there's been any change at all. I think the enthusiasm is exactly the same. I just want to just go back to this idea of balkanizing, you know, dividing up Ukraine, which is, you know, the kind of thing 19th century statesmen used to do. Bulgaria, for example, was divided up into various different places. I think this would be extremely difficult to do today. I think that for the Russians to balkanize and parcel up Ukraine and to say, you know, this region you know, can be this, give you know, can be run this way and love another way. And I think in order for the Russians to do that, they would actually have to be physically present there. <laughs> I think that if they were not physically present in these places, um, any sort of lines they draw might very, very quickly lose their reality. I mean, you could easily see things like that come together again. And I suspect there would be pressures from people within Ukraine to come together again. So I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm sure there are people in Moscow who draw these, you know, little lines across the map of Ukraine. I don't think that they're realistic. And I don't think Putin himself and Lavrov and people like that actually thinks think that they are realistic. My own personal view, for what it's worth, is that I think that the Russians would be very ill-judged to try and advance into central Ukraine and western Ukraine and try to manage this place themselves. I think it would create enormous problems for them. It would be a huge drain also on their economy. It would create endless tensions with Europe, which at some point, presumably, the Russians would want to see end. And I think that uh, Odessa has an almost magical pull for them. And I suspect that there is quite a lot of Ru Russian sentiment still in Odessa. And they might be able to sort of get away with that and bring the Black Sea coast in. But I think if they start you know, meddling in places like, you know, Zhitomir and Vinitsa and those sort of places. I think that it would be most ill-advised Ill for them to go, to go there. And 
just coming back to what I said, I I think Putin himself probably deep down understands this. And um, I suspect that eventually at some point he will tell all these people like Volodin and the others, um, you know, look, you know, we've swallowed as much as we can. Um, let's not um, try and swallow more because we'll get a very, very bad case of indigestion if we do. Alexander, this is why I think Putin was so reluctant to invade Ukraine to begin with. I mean, here in the West, everybody thinks that he was just itching to invade Ukraine. He wanted to conquer it, annex it, and so forth and so on. I believe nothing can be further from the truth. I think Putin fully understand, understood that going into Ukraine would be entering into a hornet's nest. And he did it because he felt ultimately he had no choice. Hmm. And I would note that one thing I've learned over the years, going back to when I first entered the American military during the Vietnam War, is that nationalism is a remarkably powerful force. And when one country tries to do social engineering in another country, you invade another country and you try to do social engineering, you are invariably going to get yourself into really deep trouble. Think the Americans in Vietnam, think the Soviets in Afghanistan, think the Americans in Afghanistan, think the Americans in Iraq. It almost always ends up badly because the local population doesn't want an outsider coming in and telling them how to run their politics. And you invariably get resistance. Again, this goes back to our discussion of the Israelis in Gaza. As I said before, they would have been better off just trying to continue to manage the problem rather than go into Gaza and do major league social engineering. And finally, I would point out, as I have said on a number of occasions in recent months, that the Soviets or the Russians have significant experience occupying territory in Eastern Europe. And it was not a pleasant experience. The last mm -hmm. thing they want to do is be back in Poland, back in the Baltic states, back in Romania. This is just not the way to do business. So I think uh, Putin uh, will go to great lengths not to overstep uh, and not to get too deeply involved in areas in Ukraine where uh, there are lots of ethnic Ukrainians. And the idea that he would pursue a scheme that was designed to cut up uh, what's left of Ukraine uh, strikes me as a far-fetched idea. Not that any of I, us... Yeah, to, to, cl uh, no, to clarify, I meant if they can reach Odessa, but uh, local sentiment doesn't permit for swallowing it, then uh, having, you know, some temporary occupation, I don't know if, if, if it will turn in that direction. But obviously, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't think anyone in Moscow in the right mind would ever want to march further west uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're <laughs> Yeah, we, yeah, well, as uh, I think you used the word swallowing a hedgehog as a <laughs> as a way of describing it. Uh, swallowing in a porcupine. Porcupine, sorry, that's the one. <laughs> oh, no. Well, be, uh, yeah, before we start wrapping things up, I also wanted to ask both of you about, uh, the, yeah, much like in uh, in the Middle East, how how it, how can this uh, spread from here on? Uh, because uh, this seems to be. So far, we've been lucky, I think, but uh, that there hasn't uh, spread in other regions. But now that things appear to be unraveling uh, along the front lines in Ukraine, uh, it, it could. Uh, I know the Georgians, uh, they complained that they thought uh, Ukraine was planning a Maidan regime change in Georgia to you know, mm -hmm. set up a southern front against the Russians. Uh, others worry Moldova that uh, you know, NATO and Ukrainians can go in to knock out Transnistria and the, the Russian peacekeepers there. Others look to Finland, uh, Sweden, uh, Norway. Where, where, where are we going with this? Uh, do you see it as likely, or if so, uh, which direction do you think we might be heading? You want to go first, Alexander? And well, I, 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 can I just say, coming back to a point that John made again, I haven't read the speech that he gave properly. I haven't, you know, 
read it through carefully. But from what I could see, there were long passages in it in which Putin set out his own deep reluctance before the war to start a conflict there. And, you know, he, he obviously gives his own account of this and his own perspective of this and his own reasons. But he makes it very clear. The one thing that did seem to me very clear was that everything that happened, in ter- which eventually led up to the war, was on his side, and of course he would say on Russia's side, a forced response to things that the other side, the West in particular, and the Ukrainians to a great extent, were doing. That it was not something at all that he had set out to do right from the outset. So I I think that is actually there in the speech. Now, of course, it's Putin. Putin says that. Some people will say, well, because Putin says it, it's not necessarily true. Maybe he was planning to reconstitute the empire all along. But anyway, that is what he said. And can I just say, John, I completely agree with you. I I don't think Putin had any such plans. Um, I think he went, as he says, to immense lengths to avoid the situation we are in today. It was not the optimal situation for him. It still isn't. And I think that my sense of where this conflict is going in terms of what Putin himself wants to do, and he might be still very naive about this, is that, yes, he wants to absorb the eastern regions, the Russian regions of Ukraine. I think in his own mind, Odessa is one. He might change his views about that, but I think for the moment, he's clear that Odessa, the Black Sea coast, these places which he believes are Russian and which are pro-Russian, they will join Russia. But for the rest, I think he accepts that there's not going to be a good relationship with the Europeans for the indefinite future. I think he also accepts that there will be a Ukraine and it will be a dysfunctional uh, state. but. It will be one that Russians will have to deal with. What he wants to see, what he would like to see, is some kind of minimal understanding with the Americans. I think that is still his preferred wish, not perhaps the kind of understanding that he looked for back in the early 2000s, but one which will allow Putin to say, well, our Western borders are secure. We don't have to worry about those things any longer. So we can, from this point on, focus on our compelling internal problems. I think that is what Putin would want to see. Whether the Americans would be interested in going there is an entirely different question. And of course, if there's going to have to be a long-term confrontation between the Americans and the Russians, Um, over this. I think Putin is prepared for that. But personally, the sense I am getting, in fact, he's even said this, he's actually said some time ago, with the Europeans, I don't see any way forward. With the Americans, we may still be able to come to some kind of understanding. Uh, Let me just make a point on that and then go to the escalation issue. To reinforce what you're saying, you want to remember that after the war started, there were negotiations in Istanbul, uh, and those negotiations show clearly that Putin wanted to end the war. He did not want a long war. He did not want to conquer Ukraine, right? Uh, Furthermore, he is very slow to mobilize Russia for the war. Uh, I was actually shocked over the course of the summer of 2022 that he wasn't mobilizing troops, mobilizing the economy, mobilizing the population for a protracted war once the negotiations in Istanbul failed. It wasn't until September, late September, that he mobilized 300,000 troops. He didn't annex any territory until the fall of 2022. So Putin was, you know, 
not some bloodthirsty aggressor who was looking to conquer huge chunks of uh, Ukraine from the outset. He sort of has slid into this war, uh, this protracted war, where he or Russia is going to end up annexing quite a bit of territory. But he didn't start out that way. Uh, there was an escalation in the goals, and he was rather, uh, uh, he, was an, he was a reluctant escalator, for lack of a better term. I know that in the West, it's uh, uh, very hard to make this argument without being called uh, Putin's puppet, but I do think the facts bear it out. Now, just let me say a word about escalation in response to what Glenn said. I think there's really significant potential for escalation revolving around the Ukraine war. Uh, And I want to make it clear that I believe that even when the war, the shooting comes to an end and you have some frozen conflict or armistice or whatever, the potential for escalation will still be there. Now, when I say there's much potential for escalation, what am I talking about? Uh, I talk about five flashpoints. One is the Black Sea. Two is Moldova. Three is Belarus. What happens when Lukashenko goes? The Americans will try to foster a color revolution in Belarus. Oh, my goodness. You know, Belarus is strategically as important as Ukraine is to the Russians. So Belarus is three. Four is the Baltic. Now that uh, Finland and Sweden are in NATO, if you look at the Baltic, it's surrounded, save for the Russians, by all NATO states. And then finally, there's the Arctic. There are eight countries that are physically located in the Arctic. Seven of them are now NATO members. The lone exception, of course, is the Russians. And without the ice melting, there's all sorts of potential for disputes up there. So again, if you think about it, the Black Sea, Moldova, Belarus, the Baltic, and the Arctic. Uh, And we're talking about a conflict that's not going to go away. The shooting may end, but the West, as we were all saying before, is committed to causing trouble for Russia for as far as the eye can see. And the Russians, therefore, will have an incentive to cause trouble in Europe, to cause trouble in Ukraine, and to cause trouble with regard to transatlantic relations for as far as the eye can see. So I think the potential for escalation surrounding the Ukraine conflict, much like the potential for escalation surrounding the Gaza war, is significant and worrisome in the extreme. I, I agree. And I mean, you can already see that there's um, also problems in the Balkans as well, which is, again, a region I know. But uh, uh, there's unrest now, apparently, in Bulgaria. And of course, there's been a, there's a political crisis in Serbia and uh, the, the Balkans, the Balkans also is potential flash flashpoint. But all of the ones that you said, um, uh, John, you're absolutely correct. Any final thoughts uh, before we finish this? Well, uh, just to say again, uh, uh, an opportunity for a rapprochement, a successful peace lost. And the reason again is, um, I, I would say, because um, policies that were, policies were just policies were made in Europe that were not judged to the realities, the actual European realities. And in a kind of a way, the same in the Middle East. I mean, I'm not saying the you know, peace in the Middle East was um, as easily achieved there. I don't know the Middle East so well. But I, I think that we could have had a much more stable situation in the U- Middle East a long time ago if diplomacy had been, if, if foreign policy rather, had been conducted more um, realistically. And if we're looking at, you know, long-term confrontations with the Russians in Europe, a long-term commitment by the United States to preserving an unstable and impossible situation in Israel, um, with Israel, even as pressures for the United States to focus on the Asia-Pacific seem compelling. Well, if we have all of these 
things going on at the same time. It's because of a whole set of mistaken decisions and bad policy outcomes, which could have been avoided and should have been avoided. I make one final point, and that has to do with the discourse uh, surrounding both uh, the Israel case and the Russia case. As I pointed out before, uh, because of the lobby's influence in the United States, it's almost impossible to have a meaningful discourse about Israel uh, and, and uh, even about the Gaza war, uh, certainly in the mainstream media. I think uh, when you talk about Russia and you talk about the Ukraine war, as the three of us know very well, uh, since the war started on February 24th, 2022, it is well nigh impossible in the mainstream media to have a meaningful discussion about Russia and about Ukraine, because people who have our view, our basic view of the situation are excluded from the discourse. I would make the argument that when you are in a liberal society, uh, it's very important that you don't let these illiberal, illiberal tendencies come to the fore uh, and quash out um, a meaningful or eliminate a meaningful marketplace of ideas. I just think it's very important that people be able to talk about uh, controversial issues and that people who have views that uh, contradict or challenge the conventional wisdom be allowed uh, to make their case and, and to be heard in, in effect. And I think with regard to Israel, again, that has not been the case for a long time, and it's to the detriment of Israel and the United States. And I think with regard to the Russian case, and especially with regard to the Ukraine war, as the three of us know very well, that has certainly been the case. And, and we have not been served well by that. And I think moving forward, more and more people in the West ought to be self-reflective about this issue. And there ought to be uh, some attempt made to open up the discourse and to let the dissenters have their say uh, based on the principle that this is for the good of the country, that it's good for making sound decisions. It doesn't guarantee you'll make a sound decision, but I believe that having an open discourse maximizes the prospects that you'll do the right thing. Or if you don't do the right thing, you'll make a quick correction. But in the world that we live in, uh, it's very hard for voices like ours uh, to be heard in the mainstream. I completely agree with that. And I would also add, by the way, that in my opinion, far too many decisions nowadays in the West are not only made um, without proper discussion, but are made to a great extent in secret. <laughs> I don't want to push this too far, but I mean, I think that particularly, for example, about the Syrian war, for example, all sorts of decisions were made by all sorts of people, um, a sm relatively small group of people talking to each other, not listening to people from outside who perhaps knew the area and the region and the complexities there better. And the result was a very, very bad decisions were made. And if that is only possible when debate is basically shut down. Because if you want to maximize your security, I, I always advise start with the security dilemma. You know, like, how do you elevate your security without undermining the security of your opponent? Uh, the problem, I feel, is you're not allowed to discuss even the security of the opponent. Try to explain the security concern of the Palestinians. Well, then you hate Jews, you're told. You know, try to explain the security concern of the Russians. Well, now you're legitimizing imperialism. So I think this is yeah, also what uh, John, and as well as you, Alexander, referring to this. Uh, they were eff effectively wiped out all space for debate. And if you can't have debate, this competition of ideas, how can you possibly uh, reach uh, yeah, good good policies, which actually elevates your security instead of just you know, fueling this... Uh, uh, yeah, hate, I would say, to a large extent. So, um, anyways, uh, thank you so much again. Uh, not every day we speak to the great John Mersheimer, so it's a great privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Alexander. It was a privilege to talk to you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. <laughs>